Hi, everyone. Welcome to our webinar on winning strategies to subscription apps in 2022. A uh, huge thanks to our partners, Liftoff and Wangle, who are co-hosting this along with us at Rocketship HQ. Right, uh, I'm excited to introduce our panelists for today. Right, uh, Carolyn Rota, Carolyn heads performance marketing at Yazio, a leading nutrition app. Carolyn began with Yazio, Yazio as an intern and built up the performance marketing team starting from when Yazio first started with paid ads. Uh, Meryl, could we go to two slides from now, please? Two slides from now? Yes. Yeah. Great. And our second panelist is Hisham Belvis Dad. Hisham is a senior account executive CSC at Liftoff and Wangle. He's responsible for driving new business across Central, South, and Eastern Europe. And he has over 10 years of experience in the digital advertising space. A third panelist is Lisa Canelli. Lisa is a marketing and communications professional who is now the CMO at Fishbrain, which is the world's most popular phishing app uh, with more than 14 million users worldwide that enjoy phishing as a sport. And our final guest is Thomas Petit. Thomas is an independent mobile growth consultant working primarily with non-gaming B2C apps. He's an external consultant for large apps and is a collaborator for with many app agencies and an advisor to many early stage startups. Very excited to have you guys. This is a, an all-star panel. I'm very thrilled to have you guys today. Right, uh, let's to get started, right? So now that the dust has, oh, this is me. I'm Shamant, uh, the founder and CEO of Rocketship HQ, host of the Mobile User Acquisition Show. Uh, please check check out the podcast, mobileuseracquisitionshow.com. So definitely uh, lots of interesting stuff about all things mobile and growth over there. So let's jump into today's webinar, right? So, you know, now that the dust has more than settled on ATT, it's been a while, it's 2022. Now, what do you see as some of the bigger challenges that are unique to subscription apps in 2022? Carolyn, uh, would love for you to kick us off. Sure. Um, first of all, hello, everyone. I'm happy to be here. Um, challenges for 2022. I think there are lots of challenges. Um, some of them, I would say, first of all, maybe subscription tiredness that might come up or might even be become stronger because everything now is a subscription or an app so our job is to make yeah users life as easy as possible um, for example expanding payment methods um, building a pricing structure to fit customers needs introducing lifetime offers all that stuff um, just to make the user as happy as possible um, and then i think looking at the broader picture because Missing data accuracy is a huge thing still and ongoing. So for example, looking at blended ROAS, incorporating organic traffic into strategy, that's also nothing really new, but more important than ever from my perspective. And then the extensive use obviously of first party data because we are not really used to it. And we have it now, for example, from Google and Facebook and yeah, that would be my three top challenges for 2022. Yeah, yeah. And we'll certainly dive into all of those as we go along. Uh, but Thomas, I would love to get your perspective on what you see as the bigger challenges as we go forward. Like one, one challenge I see is, I mean, until ATT showed up, there was a playbook that I would say 80 or 90% of subscription were following, which is acquisition mainly driven by paid and monetization, very aggressive, onboarding paywalls. You use the app, there's a paywall jumping at you every three seconds, which is basically you pay or you stop using. And I think now with this remix in marketing, there's a lot of people who are starting to question, is this actually the only way? There's a bunch of apps who weren't doing that, but I think they were the minority. And now they're looking like people we should inspire from and copy. I'm thinking about, um, a lot of network effect app like Old Trails or Strava, uh, apps like Duolingo who built a brand earlier and didn't fit the this other model. 
And I think it, it's not about copying Duolingo or Strava, but more like rethinking, okay, there might be another way to rebalance the model and freemium means freemium. It doesn't mean you put a paywall to everybody. Can we make value from free user, actually from virality and others, but at the price of maybe a little bit less monetization and a little bit less hardcore paid acquisition. And a lot of apps I believe are thinking about that, but need to find their own balance in the spectrum of, of let's say, um, monetization aggressivity. And I think that's that's a very interesting strategy challenge for, for the long term that ATT has pushed us to rethink a little bit. And basically what I'm saying is that the, the old playbook is being put in question yeah. this year. Yeah, yeah. So monetization isn't as aggressive. You can't be as aggressive with monetization as you, you used to be. You can. It's just one way of doing yeah. business. Right, right. Certainly there are other paths that have opened up, certainly. And we'll certainly talk about a lot of those other paths to go forward, right? Uh, I'm also curious, you know, I'm curious, uh, how have you guys seen advertising channel mix change since ATT? And how do you see this changing, you know, in 2022? Uh, Lisa, I would love to hear from you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so definitely we, as a result of last year, you know, realized we had to make some changes um, and commit some resources to that. So. Um, I've been doing a lot of work personally within my team on looking at you know, partnerships as a potential distribution source for us. So of course we still spend a lot on paid. We're still looking at like the channels that have always worked, but we're also looking at, okay, you know, who's upstream from us in the customer journey for our specific customer and how can we get into that conversation? Um, so that's definitely something we've been doing more of. Um, I would also say like more of an emphasis on content and for us also more of an emphasis on offline marketing than we've ever done like really a willingness to like, let's print up a bunch of flyers with QR codes and like put Ooh. those in places where people are going to be because um, I think, and I think what's interesting, it's different is that there's a lot more understanding from um, other stakeholders in the company and even like investors or board members that like they really see this too. So maybe there's more willingness to do that than before where it's just like, go give Facebook money and they spit users out at you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, Lisa, you and I talked about this, but if you have a QR code, it's actually more trackable than Facebook is uh, in some ways, right? Because you are able to track who's installing using the QR code, which is an interesting side effect of what you just described. Exactly. We'll see what the adoption is, how many people actually use a QR code to download an app. I mean, that's that yes yeah. to be seen. Yeah, 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 yeah. And Hishan, you certainly see a number of apps across the subscription space. I'm curious what you are seeing in terms of the channel mix uh, for advertisers. Yeah, what I, I think that the uh, advertiser are, are trying to figure out, so how they will complete the data, how to optimize to get the complete ROAS or CPA value. And in order to get around these challenges with SCAN, uh, marketers are doing a few different things. Uh, one is, uh, for example, shifting budget to Android to do their uh, A-B tests because the, the data is more re reliable, at least for now. Sure. And sure. until... Uh, there is some more, more, more changes. Uh, so spend on Android has increased and competition and the price, uh, pricing as well on Android now. Uh, other option that I, I've seen is uh, to run campaign on the web. So to try and direct uh, direct user to landing page to download the mobile, the mobile app, app, which give you a uh, website uh, tracking and data. Okay. And uh, if I will add something else, I think the influencer uh, campaign as well are getting uh, more and more used than before because you can measure uh, ROAS in a more accurate way. Um, yes, and uh, lastly, um, I can see that marketers are also exploring a more top-down approach to measurement. Uh, they are evaluating the media mix and they're using uh, modeling and incrementality as an alternative to, to, to decide how, how to, to choose the, the, the right budget uh, with the channels. Yeah, so what I'm hearing you guys say is really there's more exploration of channels. Like Lisa said, there's a lot more offline. Vishen, you're seeing a lot more on the influencers, web-based flows, and Carolyn, you're nodding too, so I'm curious if you have anything to add there too. Yeah. 
Yeah, right. Like for us, it's the same. We're doing lots of partnership and influencers. We tried TV and out of home uh, first time this January, which which was of course something that came out of the whole um, yeah ATT uh, disruption, so to say. And beyond yeah. that, we try to think beyond the duop duopoly of Facebook and Google, like adding new channels. Um, like programmatic, trying new campaign types, for example, spark ads on TikTok and stuff, adding yeah. a web funnel, um, all that stuff. Yeah. So yeah, we are trying to think new. <laughs> sure, so there's a lot more diversity in terms of distribution channels that you guys see. And certainly I think that's a theme I'm hearing across the board. Uh, so that certainly makes sense, right? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm also curious, right, obviously, Scan is still, you know, you, you guys briefly touched on some of the measurement challenges. Scan still remains a key part of measurement. It's not the only game in town. Uh, I'm also curious as to what schema, uh, is there anything interesting in terms of the schemas that you're finding that's being effective with subscription apps? And because the obvious schema would be to have trials and the schema built around trials, but is there anything else that you're seeing that's interesting? And uh, Carolyn, I know you, you have some interesting perspectives. I'd love for you to share. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because um, as we have no trials yet um, that we could, could use or anything, we are currently using only the revenue scheme, so no conversion value or engagement, so we're no, not measuring occurrence, meaning we use the six bits solely for revenue. Uh, reasons for that are that like the 64 values we have are enough for us to map our revenue range. Plus right. we don't have too many events in the app we are measuring yet, or we, we are mapping in the app just yet. Um, so the revenue scheme for us works perfectly because like we measure the exact value of the user and give a signal to the platform, like how valuable the acquired user is for us. Yeah. Yeah, that's definitely interesting because it's not a common schema. So the vast majority of subscription apps have a trial and that's the scheme I've seen. Yeah. <laughs> but it's interesting to see a very different perspective. This is almost like a free to play game, if you will. Yeah. Right. yeah. And uh, there's a question from the audience about whether there will be a recording made available. So yes, we will make a, re make a recording available after it. So if you can't stay for the entirety of this, please. Uh, feel free to drop off. You will get something in your inbox soon, right? Uh, yeah, and staying on the team is Scan, right? Uh, again, obviously, Scan has changed and evolved over, you know, ever since it was introduced. So with iOS 15, one of the things that had that was in the in the news to some extent was that with iOS 15, Scan is sending post packs to advertisers. Now, obviously, technically that is true, but how has that impacted day-to-day -day operations, if at all it has? So, uh, Thomas, I don't know if you wanna take that. Yeah. Yeah, sure. I mean, I was very excited when Apple announced this. I was like, wow, fantastic. We're gonna have possibility to get it ourselves. So networks can tamper with it or, or try to hide it or aggregate it or whatever. So that was very excited. And I thought it would be more comparable also between networks. And then I didn't instruct my team to retrieve them at all, basically because iOS 15 took forever to get adopted. I don't know why yeah. Apple like slow it down. We're now at maybe, I don't know, 70%. So that's it. But it took like six months to get there, which, and anyway, when, when the line crossed 50 or 60%, I say, okay, let's look at this post back now. And and I look at this post back and it was not what I expected. There's a bunch of super interesting information if you're running media mix modeling and stuff like that about read downloads, about is this a win or an assist? Um, so that's extremely valuable, the parameter that come with it. There are two problems, like not only that is simple because it's only iOS 15, so it's not the complete scan view, it's just a partial view, but it's the fact that you receive campaign ID that you have no idea what they are. So in a, in a like reconciling with what you're actually spending, my campaign A, B, C, and then I've got campaign one, two, three, and I'm like, which A is one, yeah. which B is two, like kind of tricky. When you run just a few campaign on, on the, <clears throat> some networks, relatively easy to infer. Like, okay, I've got a big one, a small one. That's the big one. 
But then you enter yeah. a bunch of networks and Facebook being the biggest of them who run sub campaigns in the background. And that's why we're limited to eight or nine campaign instead of Apple's limit of 99 because they run sub campaign in the background. Good luck figuring out which campaign is which campaign. Yeah. And yeah. to date, I haven't found any way to match those ID yeah. with what is my campaign. So yeah. I mean, at scale, you could argue that there is a way to infer but it's very tricky. And the result of this is me now, I'm not using it. And it's a yeah. bit of a shame that I'm not. I do believe that these extra parameters uh, can bring us, for, for those with advanced modeling capability, they bring us something very interesting to look at, but at the moment for me, it's not practical. So I'm a bit sad, but yeah. I'm not using them. Exactly what I'm seeing too, that it's practically useless. Uh, I have spoken to large advertisers who also just have said it's just not something they are able to use just now. Uh, but Hishin, I'm curious to hear from you. Right? So you guys see a lot of pushbacks. Uh, you guys see a lot of data. I'm curious if you are see what you're seeing at your end. I mean, what we see is that um, I mean, for advertisers that are using MMP uh, probabilistic matching, uh, they should be more or less the same as before. And most of our customers continue to leverage uh, MMP attribution. Yeah. So uh, at Liftoff, we we try to bring the market to bring to the market the best possible uh, machine learning model that can leverage scan postback and MMP double opt-in postback to drive performance, uh, which is a something very difficult. Uh, but I believe that advertiser that can adjust to new uh, measurement uh, model as a uh, was mentioning, I would be in the advantageous position compared to, to competitors. So I think it's, it's the right time now to, 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 to work on that, even if yeah, the probabilistic magic is still accurate as from yeah. what I, I see on my side. Yeah, 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 right. And just speaking of probabilistic models, right? So obviously that is not scan, that's a non-scan measurement paradigm. Right. How effective are you finding this for advertisers? Again, you should, uh, would love to hear from you since, again, you see a number of advertisers. Right. And A, how effective do you find this? And B, how does that answer change with scale? Is it meaningful for advertisers at a small scale? What scale does it change and become meaningful? Um, the thing is that, yes, so uh, major, um, publishing matching, it avoids most of the drawback that comes with scan attribution. Uh, uh, that's why a lot of advertisers uh, like the, the, this way of, of working. So because you get the post back in real time, uh, there is not privacy censorship threshold. Uh, you can get multiple post back per user and each uh, post back as a rich data set. So it's just like in yeah. the days of uh, IDFA attribution. Uh, so I believe it, it allows for uh, more refined optimization. So in theory should help driving uh, better better performance yeah 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 right and again thomas i know you look at a number of apps i'm curious if you see an increasing adoption of probabilistic channels lately uh, what, what do you say it's hard to say how the market is moving based on a sample you know because at the end of the day uh, i only see a, a few apps i believe in gaming, there probably was a bit of a shift of, of money towards uh, networks that use probabilistic uh, attribution because the, the richness of this data is, is, is so good. Um, slight shift because, I mean, there's still a lot of inventory on, on sands that is very valuable. In the subscription space, for a reason that I'm not exactly sure of, but uh, those networks have always represented a fairly small total share. Uh, if you mix big networks like Aplovin, uh, Colony, Iron Source, and the likes, but also all DSPs and Liftoff, for some reason in subscription mix, they tend to be less. And I haven't seen like a massive shift of money there yet. But I've seen a big appetence of, hey, we're not doing any of this. Why? And, and to try. So I believe we're not yet at this point where the shift has been really significant. And they also have like present um, challenges to, to make uh, profitability happen. So maybe yeah. it's early. Maybe we needed time. Maybe we're just slow. The subscription yeah. marketers, maybe we're a bit slow. But uh, 
I'm not saying massive moves of budget. I'm saying curiosity and questions and tests and, and oh, next quarter, let's do this. But so far, in my opinion, it hasn't materialized in, in a mass, massive shift yet. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's in line with what I'm saying. The subscription apps, there's certainly more willingness to test. Uh, certainly, there are a couple of non subscription consumer facing apps that I know are doing very, very well. Uh, but again, each product is different. Uh, so, but certainly, I do see great, greater appetite to test lately. But, yeah, that's uh, the thing. I'll add, um, for me, it's very curious. You know, I see delivery apps, they use these networks a lot. Fintech exactly. apps, they use these networks a lot. Gaming, they use these networks a lot. Yeah. And then you look at the yeah. subscription space with like education, health and fitness, productivity, and then then using them that much. And I say, why, why is yeah. that? Like, I've seen a few struggle to get performance, but it does, it, maybe it wasn't the network's fault, maybe it was this specific apps. But I do see in general, there's a gap between like, gaming non-subscriptions apps and subscription apps in this and to me it's a, it's a question i don't have the answer it's like why is the marketing mix yeah. so different for subscription apps yeah, bit, bit yeah. surprising yeah 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 i don't know if you want to add anything or you should go to the next question if you have anything to add no but it's true that uh, the shift is more for the other vertical it's what i've seen uh, on my side as well and it's uh, more difficult for subscription apps so yeah there's is something we need to work on yeah but, uh, you know, again, just to switch gears, the other big challenge lately, which I know all of you touched on at least a little bit was just measurement, right? So we were recently looking at, oh, oh, oh you know, there's Scan, there's Travelistic, there's Apple Ad Services, and there's Firebase if you're using Google UAC. Google technically has Scan, but, like literally every Google account we've looked at, if you look at the scan reported metrics, it's astronomical. So that's just four different sources right there. How are you making sense of four different sources making, telling four different stories, potentially more, right? So how you make, and obviously, you know, Catalyst, you talked about TV and OOH. Lisa, you talked about QR code. Obviously that's a completely different measurement paradigm. How are you guys making sense of multiple, measurement paradigms. Lisa, I would love to hear from you. Yeah, sure. I mean, it's definitely been a shift and I would say it's a shift like really in terms of our internal culture and being a subscription app that's been around for like almost, well, the yeah, company's been around for 10 years, been doing subscriptions for almost that long, you know, to shift away from the mentality of let's look at organic versus paid and like compare that ratio. And we just like, forget doing that guys. We're not doing that anymore. It's not really helpful. And it's like, we can't look at this on this channel by channel basis. So I think that's something that is a continual evolution because as we look at all of these different channels and increase our sort of marketing mix, we constantly still get, okay, and so if we do this, how many registrations will it get us? How many subscribers will it get us? And sort of being like, okay, we can have a benchmark. Sure, we should have some goals for that, but like, let's be realistic about how well we can measure that and more look at like overall, are we gonna see our customer acquisition costs, you know, going down across the board? You know, and maybe we can segment it more into sort of chunks of types of channels. Right. So, so we do try to do that, I think, is sort of like this chunk we can measure of these paid channels and this chunk of these partnerships we can measure together um, versus looking at things so like individually. Cool. Interesting. Uh, Catalin, uh, you mentioned TV and OOH. How are you thinking about all of this? Yeah, it is uh, still a challenge. Like we uh, honestly still compare sources on an ongoing basis and there happen to be kind of parties <laughs> when the data between the partner and the mobile measurement partner and whatever matches um, though currently our MMP is still our go-to source for everything that goes beyond channel level and we have a good knowledge on how much deviation is normal for what channel and that helps us so we know when are we doing good and when do we need to like wave a red flag um so so that's that's how we handle that stuff and also surely we changed our whole like mind and changed to a more blended view so that helped us here as well not to be that dependent on that number on the on the ad level or on the ad set level for one specific campaign or anything yeah, yeah. So sounds like you guys are looking in terms of looking at this as clusters of channels, types of channels, 
and right. evaluating them differently, right? That is, again, in a deterministic paradigm, it's like all channels can be precisely measured. Now it's like some can, some can't, and you're going right. to treat them differently. <laughs> right. Yeah. And uh, I know this came up at least briefly, just understanding incrementality, right? Have you guys used incrementality based measurement? What methodologies have you guys used? What results are you seeing? Uh, Carolyn, since you talked about some of this. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, right, that's, that's one of our, yeah, our tries to, to make sense out of data. Um, so we haven't uh, used incrementality measurement yet, but we are currently working on a marketing mix modeling approach, like to yeah. estimate the true value, for example, of Facebook on our business metrics. So the the end or the result of this will be aggregated data on an ad level. So the outcome will be impact on channel investment on overall results. And this will provide us with a macro overview. So no campaign or ad level. That's not uh, where this is going, but this modeling will hopefully help us to at least solve the measurement issue of the post at t world, at least to like, yeah, some, some degree. <laughs> Yeah, so you're saying you can assign value of weight to each channel, including the offline ones. Right. So able to do. Yeah, yeah. We we just match them all together, and then we use a linear in, linear regression, and then have the model, um, yeah, estimate yeah. the value for us. How reliable are you finding these estimates lately? We are not there yet, so we're just in okay. the. It's a work in progress, so we're just building it up. So I can share some insights maybe later. <laughs> oh, cool, cool, cool. Yeah, we had our first version of a model this week. So mm -hmm. it was fine tuning it, but definitely very promising results. Oh, nice. um, yeah. Yeah, we, we use Facebook's Robin, uh, which yeah. seems easier than yeah. we originally anticipated it to be. Uh, Thomas, again, you see a number of apps. I'm curious what you're noticing in this case. Yeah, I've uh, I've seen three three different approaches on that, and I have to say they're all valuable, but all really tricky to interpret to okay. get confidence. Like all of them, and also in their implementation, the for two of them they're a bit uh, difficult. The one that is simple, I, I work with a partner called Incremental, so they're basically out of the box incrementality analysis. Mm -hmm. um, I believe it's a really good complement to what we get from scan and consented cohort and the blended. Yeah. You can't make it the single source of truth uh, either. Uh, but for me, it's a really good complement. If you can afford to have one more, we already okay. have a lot. So that also okay. adds complexity inside the team and for the decision. But uh, it does sometimes bring like, oh, we believe this happened and we would double check and like, oh, this model say the same. So we would be a little bit more confident. So that help. And, and it's out of the box. So that's what I've been using. Uh, they're also iterating pretty fast on the product. The other two were in-house. Um, one is, is really media mix modeling. And we're doing this before ATT internally. We're basically taking span and impression and we're looking at, at uh, new revenue trends. And we're trying to make assumptions from that. Uh, it's hard to build if you build it from scratch. When we did, Robin didn't exist. So we started from zero oh. and it took us, if I'm not wrong, 18 months or 15 months or something. Uh, okay. Eventually did bring like a really interesting insight about actually those channels have a much bigger impact than we believe. And that was typically the case for higher funnel channel, including YouTube, TikTok, Pinterest, uh, where those impressions do not necessarily convert into install immediately, but they they participate to like, it's not necessarily assigning install, but assigning event, eventually downstream impact. And we did shift a bit more budget on these channels because it was more than what the last click was saying. So typically you would assign less to search if anybody is asking what's the opposite, <laughs> of course. Um, <laughs> but But it's tricky and... It really works at channel level. You can't make conclusion with that of, oh, 
I've decreased that campaign by 20%. Was it incremental or not? Like the media mix model is not going to answer this. Like yeah. it's very strategic high level about budget assignment between channels. It's not tactical yeah. for you execution. And, yeah. and the last one we're looking at right now, it's not finished of building. And the more the project advances, and the less I'm confident it's going to be solid is we're trying to build a similar matching between the scan number we receive and make a regression analysis towards revenue. Like when Facebook is telling me I'm paying $30 for a scan trial, can I make the equivalent in, oh, that means $60 in revenue or, or whatever it is. And there are a number of challenges doing that. Um, it's really hard to build. Um, one being that the scan value coming from one network and another network, they're not yeah. the same. Like I cannot say, oh, okay, a scan trial is worth $30 because then a scan trial on this network is worth 20 and on that network is worth 45. And two weeks later, the value has changed. It's not fixed over time. So I'm in the middle of building this. Uh, it's been tricky. Overall, like if I have to summarize those, I say it's good to have an eye on these models to confirm. I mean, as the level of uncertainty raised, because that's what happened last year, basically our uncertainty yeah. on, on profitability and on channel return as raised, it provides one more input about, am I actually making the right decisions? But it's not an input you can rely only on. And it's a, so for me, it's a compliment and only relatively advanced team can afford to have that complement uh, on top. If you're operating at a, at a lower level, don't get into that rabbit hole and yeah. lose yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree, right? So, and you know, just in terms of finding an equivalent between scan and your revenue, one of the we tried that, and one of the challenges was the channel was the same. Apple changed the privacy threshold, and I was like, oh wait, and we didn't know that obviously because it's not documented. A lot of the calculations just went uh, into hell, right? So certainly a lot of pitfalls here. Just to also follow up, right, Carolyn, would love to hear from you since you talked about some of the incrementality and medium mix model, uh, modeling. How does that translate into reporting? Because again, as Thomas mentioned, it's another layer of complexity. So Carolyn, when you're looking at this data, is that presented with the UA metrics and reports? How does, how, how does the reporting happen for medium mix based sort of results? Like we're, as I said, we're not there quite yet, but we yeah. are not planning to use that data for like daily basis reporting, but more yeah. of a, yeah, higher level to see where to shift our money, maybe right. for on a weekly basis or maybe even on a monthly basis or, sure. yeah. So it's not yeah. something we are planning to really see as a kind of reporting, but more as a overview yeah. on, on how valuable are different resources and channels. Sure, right. I think what the best we have right now is to show some of the results alongside scan metrics in the mm -hmm. same, same sort of table. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously this is only channel level. And I think you guys pointed it out. It's not gonna work at the, campaign level or the ad yeah. level. At the level, you're like, look, Facebook, here's the scan, scan update, scan stat. Here's the coefficient we found from our incrementality analysis. Here's the recommended increase in budget according to MMM. Mm -hmm. So we sort of do that in different columns in the same table. But again, that's at the- Yeah, that, yeah that's a good idea, actually. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right, uh, yeah, you know, just to switch gears, Again, uh, we talked a bit about web flows. And again, I talked with you guys one on one about this. What have you tried? What are you seeing working? Uh, Lisa, would, uh, would love to hear from you. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, we've been trying to crack web for a long time, and we've had a lot of, I would say, false starts and wrong directions. Um, I would say the biggest mistake we've made has been spending a lot of time building out sort of the product, like a web version of the product. Um, which I don't really think the rest of our marketing organization was sort of set up to support or had the resources to support. So um, yeah, that's that's definitely been the sort of like, okay, you know, we see this opportunity for a lot of SEO and a lot of organic growth. And, you know, obviously it's cheaper on the web. We see this great opportunity. Like how do we actually do that as a company that, that's been historically an app company and doesn't have a lot of web experience? 
And then also, even if we get all that traffic, how do we convert it? And what do we convert it to? Because for a long time yeah. it was like, oh, let's convert them to just web. It's cheaper. We'll save money from the app on Google tax. And now we're like, oh, no, no, no. Let's get them all to the app. We don't care. Forget everything on the web. So it's, it's been quite a yeah. journey. Um, yeah, yeah it, it's, it's, it's been interesting. I'll, I'll say that. <laughs> certainly, yeah, that certainly challenges that I have seen as well. Uh, yeah, uh, Thomas, what are, you, what are you seeing? I started this journey, I think in 2017 and I'm still failing at it regularly. Uh, okay. There are a couple of stuff I learned uh, along the way. One is that People do it for mostly the wrong reason. So when we started, it was like, oh, we don't want to pay the 30% anymore. And that's totally a wrong reason. Yeah. Then you realize your conversion is more than 30% less on the web. So you're losing money. Uh, it's a wrong motivation, but eventually I, I keep insisting because one for me, a big, big reason to get there is not to circumvent measurement either. Like, okay, I don't have a scale network. I'm going to go there because I'm going to be able to track, which to some extent is true. Uh, but mostly for channel diversification. Like uh, I want to have more weaponry. They're not necessarily the same users you're gonna reach. Um, remember when there was the LAT user, which are now coming to Android, those would not see ads on Facebook and, and Google because uh, of like attribution. So that's not the case anymore, but I believe there is an audience expansion on participating. Let's say uh, you only have Facebook. Well, I'd rather have Facebook app ads than Facebook web ads. For Google, that's especially true in the sense of uh, UAC can be super efficient for some, but you don't have too much the control about, and you don't have the insight about keywords, specific channels, sometimes for like performance, but also branding reason. We want to like, oh yeah, let's advertise yeah. hardcore on those channels specifically as a kind of a paid media play and not pure performance. That's not something you can do on UAC. So having a web journey in this sense really enables to like unlock channels that you don't operate the same way or maybe don't even exist. Like kind of uh, Pinterest has shut down their app install product. I heard there's a workaround that I haven't tried. I just uh, learned that Shop. last month. Uh, but anyway, like there's just a web product and for some pro like yeah, I mean, for some specific apps, Pinterest is a really interesting, like valuable channel in terms of the audience you can reach. So for me, it's really channel diversification and, and audience expansion is the real motivator. But then you get to the execution part and it's not a walk in the park. Like uh, I see apps both succeeding and failing with two completely different approach. One being a very direct journey where people would be redirected to a very simple learning page, which objective is to go to the app store as soon as possible. And other take a much more longer route where maybe you don't have the full product on the web, or that might happen, but you do start onboarding user on the web. And I know a bunch of apps doing that. Noom has been doing that forever. They were the really pioneer in, in that, but now a lot of people are trying to copy that. It does work to some extent. I believe the motivation of people of onboarding people on the web is actually to put the payment at the end of it, but that's not the only reason to do it. Like uh, you don't have the, the, the drop off of the, of the store page. So it's true that you can start communicating a bit. And, and to some extent, even if you don't sign up and make people pay on the web, you can also raise user intent before they get to the, to the app store. And I believe that's a really good way of approaching it of, okay, it's going to yeah. be more than one page, but I don't intend to put friction in there about, I have to yeah. accept the pop-ups and I have to put my email and I have to put my credit card and like all, all the friction that we have at onboarding, you can make a really nice flow that is actually made for delight and put the user in a situation after a five or 10 screen of, I really want this product because I'm really convinced that yeah. it delivers. And for me, that's a real motivator Be, besides the, the audience and the, the channel of really providing a bit of a different experience than being faced to the friction that are a download that are, uh, push and so on and bring the user to a state that is more likely that it will continue. That said, yeah. uh, onboarding like this takes uh, more resources um, yeah. and, and it's a lot of trial and errors. It's really hard. Like Sometimes people ask me, okay, so what are the best practice about those steps? And I'm like, I'm seeing five apps and the version deck so it is so completely different from one to another. So the playbook is being written in front of us and it's hard to share yeah. best practice. 
I personally find yeah. it exciting because then we, we have liberty to try stuff, but it makes it challenging because those are a long cycle. Like don't launch yourself exactly. and promise your boss that at the end of the quarter, you're going to have result because that's not yeah. happening. Like you may yeah. get significant gross results for next year, but you're not, you're not delivering by end of quarter for sure. Like, and if you do, I want to work for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And onboarding, certainly there's, you know, kind of like you said, Noom has like a huge, extremely long onboarding and there's other apps. I, I saw recently Porter Room, they have like a three screen onboarding. It is perfect, right? So, so there's no one size fits all. I think resources I recommend is useronboard.com for folks that are interested and growth.design. Both of them have a lot of great inspiration. Uh, but Carolyn, you've done a lot of testing on the web. Would love to hear your perspective on what you're seeing and what and what's working. Yeah, true. Um, mostly is similar to the, to what Thomas and Lisa said because we are uh, experimenter experimenting with the web funnel for one and a half years now, and we're now at a point where we say um, the performance is coming close to app install campaigns. So we have done lots of testing, lots of work. Uh, we shifted right now around thirty percent of our budget to the web funnel. Like we tested everything different landing pages, different funnels, funnel length, user flow from creative to the funnel and our core learnings. But as Thomas said, I don't know how helpful it is, but I'll just drop them here anyway, is long funnels work better than short ones. Direct funnels work better than going through a landing page, even for those channels that you might think demand more context like Outbrain, native advertising, uh, Google. Um, our major channel is obviously that we ask people to purchase a product that they haven't even downloaded yet. So right now we are adding a free trial to the web, which we haven't uh, done until now. And we hope that this shifts uh, the success um, also again. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that's certainly um, that's more testing than a lot of folks that I know. So certainly you have results that are somewhat proven out there. Yeah. But yeah, and you know, one phrase that I've heard quite a lot post ATT, including on this panel, has been first party data. Can you speak to a, obviously what that alludes, you know, what that signifies, but also how that's become more important lately? And Hisham would love to hear from you what, uh, what you're seeing and thinking. Yeah, sure. Um... I've read this uh, study from marketers. So it was saying that like 85% of US marketer and 75% of Western Europe marketer are saying that increasing their use of first party data is a high, high priority. So I think it, it becomes a, a big priority for everyone. Uh, first, because it helps you with, uh, to comply with global data protection laws. I think it's a major thing now. Uh, it stays in the end of those who collect it and gives more control and transparency over what happens with that data. Um, it's easier to obtain consent for first party data because customers know what you will do with this data. Is it for retargeting, for personalization? Is it to resell it to third party data as well? Um, and it's more accurate because you obtain it directly from your customer and prospect. Um, and I believe it's also uh, cheaper than buying data from a third party. So it has different uh, benefits that I think are more and more important for marketers. Sure. So from what you're saying, it's much more of a retention play, much more of a re-engagement play, because again, the non-consented users, you're just not going to be able to <laughs> retarget them in any way. Would that be fair? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. yeah. Cool, cool, right. Uh, and uh, obviously we talked quite a bit about onboarding uh, lately. And I know, uh, I'm curious if you're seeing a lot of early monetization change. I'm curious if you're seeing a lot of early monetization experience change post ATT, uh, just because of the way SCAN is constructed uh, or for any other reasons. Uh, I'm curious if you have any perspectives. Uh, Lisa, I would love to hear from you. I mean, I wouldn't say the monetization necessarily, but in, like onboarding, for example, one thing we're doing 
as we're working with like, okay, can we drive distribution through partners? And so it's like, if that's the channel and the first place that a potential user hears of us is through like an email from a partner, then we try to make our onboarding flow customized to the partner. So it's like, you keep seeing their logo all the time and sort of your activation mm -hmm. emails, it's all brand with that logo and messaging. So it's more consistent. Um, so it's sort of like a little more trust built up throughout the process. Um, so that's something that we were doing. We're doing, I wouldn't say anything different on the monetization side though, so sure. far. And that's via a deep link. A user yeah. clicks on, yes. let's say an email, a deep link, and user sees an onboarding experience that's customized to them. Uh, customized to the partner. Customized to the partner, that's what I mean. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 mm -hmm. yeah, that's right. Cool. Oh, no, that certainly makes sense. Uh, Carolyn, I know you talked quite a bit about some of the experiments you guys have run. Mm -hmm. Curious what uh, you're seeing it just in terms of the early product changes. Mm, for us nothing really has changed like we still like pre and post att have over 85 percent of the users purchase in the first minutes after the download so wow um yeah that's nothing that has changed ever since wow yeah i i do think just with subscription apps in particular even but those with free trial a lot of the monetization is front loaded in that way, which certainly is pretty much, I would say, consistent across all subscription apps, which I think is yeah. very favorable for scan, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. If, I, if, I, if I may hear, it's true that, I mean, in some ways, subscription apps are, were gifted and doomed by this change. But the fact that a lot of trials happened the first day was really a gift in the sense that we didn't have to heavily change the experience to actually send a SCAD network some signals and we could focus on other areas. I'm seeing a lot more work there in, in gaming where typically the strong revenue purchase were coming later and that's a problem for a SCAD network and a lot of them they're revisiting what do actually user experience on the first day that may yeah. be good for us to exploit. In the sense for many subscriptions, we didn't have to change that much. I do see a few of them that try to change a little bit the experience, especially when they don't have free trials because the amount of upfront subscription is lower. So that makes a weaker signal to optimize for and more thre more privacy threshold and trying. So, so in one case, it was like, let's specifically add the free trial because of acquisition, uh, because the signal is going to be in yeah. a higher volume, not necessarily because the trial was bringing higher revenue, but just for acquisition optimization purposes. But generally yeah. speaking, I think in the subscription space, we're in a decent place there. Um, there's always improvement in the onboarding for sure, but not sure. necessarily only for SCAD network uh, purposes. Certainly. Certainly. Well, Certainly. One thing that I'm a little bit sad with this is it's a bit of a race towards maximizing the first day trial. And in the past, when we had like the full flow or, or when you have it from QR code or whatever, you do see that I, there's not a unique correlation of how many people subscribe on day one and how many subscribe at the end of the day. And there were channels that were bringing us a lot of what I call the late converters which very often are people who retain more, invite more their friends, uh, like have a, just a higher value and also higher like payment retention, but also usage retention. And today we're completely blind on that. So it's kind of, I'm just assuming that those networks are bringing the same after the first day. And I know for sure it's not right, which is a little bit of an issue, but we have to live with that. Yeah, 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 certainly. Right. Uh, and another recent development has been around in-app payment policy changes by Apple. So how do you, A, first, you know, for folks that may not be aware, can you describe some of these changes and talk about how this has impacted or will impact your strategies going forward? At least I would love to hear from you. Sure. I mean, I think this is something where personally I'm a little burned on it. I got too excited too many times in the past, like, ooh, this is really going to change things. Like, People, they're cracking down on Apple and Google now. We're going to have to have alternate payment options. It's going to be great. And then it's sort of like nothing happens. And maybe it's sort of a domino effect and eventually it's all going to collapse. But like, you know, you see the news here. I'm in Stockholm and we see the news about like Spotify, um, you know, and it's going to be an alternate payment option. And we're like, oh, but I'm like, okay, let me see what this actually means in practice. Because um, just in terms of like our day-to-day -day operations and our planning, we don't actually... Um, 
we're not we're not changing anything in our like active strategies right now to address that. Um, okay. Yeah, I'm I'm just very cautious on believing anything until I really see it. Yeah, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. So it's in the news, but not yet in implementation. Uh, curious if any of you guys have any thoughts or inputs on anything you're testing, trying, any opportunities you're seeing. Thomas, Catalan, Christian, any of you guys? I think people are fooling themselves with the uh, with like non-stop payment. Uh, I, I was I surfaced a tweet from six months ago, and there was like something like uh, de developers are gonna freak out when they realize that actually paying thirty percent is beneficial. Uh, and, and I believe in many cases it is, it is like there's a lot of value in in owning the transaction. A lot of the times we're like, oh look, our Stripe users have a much longer lifetime value. We're like. Yeah, those are the people we acquired in another place, like in a different manner, like they were just not comparable. And at the end of the day, I mean, it's nice to, to, to iterate and so on. But I believe in the most cases, uh, people will stick to in-app payment because the conversion is just much higher and the hassle is less. Like you don't have to manage yeah. tax, you don't have to like, okay better i don't talk about the refund let's stick with tax uh, because that's a big one yeah. um and only very big apps with big ips or brand will actually leverage it it's not a surprise that spotify is making this deal with google there are two reasons behind it one spotify needs to pay 70 percent uh, royalties licensing fees on what they do so they literally can't operate at 30 percent uh, i know because i was in a similar business before and that's why the the platform make exceptions for this business uh, Amazon got 50% on, on the App Store. Spotify has a deal with Google. Reader's app, I believe, will end up having different rules to the other ones. And that's okay. They just operate a different kind of business. But you also have to see, like, I see a lot of subscription and they're like, oh, yeah, look, Netflix is doing that and Spotify is doing that. I'm like, you're not in the same business here. First, they're in the business of content. You're in the business of, um, let's call it motivation, but it can be all, all productivity. But second, you're not Netflix or Spotify. Nobody knows your brand. Like nobody wants to give your credit card to that app that has like uh, 100K customers. Like nobody wants to do that. And a few will do, but you're not Netflix. Of course, if Netflix prompt me a Stripe in the app, I'm going to input my card. On. But yeah. if Yazoo or Frischbein do, I'm sorry, but I'm not sure I will. <laughs> you have to go through Yazio's uh -oh. onboarding flow. <laughs> Once you get through Yazio's onboarding flow, let's see what you're saying. I don't mean bad here. Eh? You know, it's, it's not you. <laughs> we'll work on that. <laughs> Forget yeah. you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Great, guys. This has been great. Uh, and I think the, it's, it's a good time to start to wrap up. But as we do that, you know, let's go, uh, go around the virtual room for a rapid fire question. If you could pick one piece of advice for subscription app marketers to take away from today, uh, what would it, what would this be? Let's go around the virtual room. Uh, Hisham, do you want to start? Um, yeah, sure. I mean, I'm not a marketer, but I, we can see that the, there's a lot of changes lately. The reporting goals, uh, creative tasting, all of that has changed. So, I guess you need to ensure that you and your partner have a strong plan, and that you continue testing and staying uh, nimble with uh, all of these changes. So good luck to all uh, marketers uh, with all the work you have. Excellent, thank you for bringing your perspectives, uh, Lisa, would you like to go next? Sure, I mean, I guess my takeaway would be to go back up like 30,000 feet. And if you feel stuck, look at who your customer is and what your customer is. Cause it's so easy to get caught in like, oh, what's everyone else doing? What's this app doing? Yeah. What are these different channel opportunities? And like, remember that you're you and your app is unique and your customer is unique. And if you think about where is my customer and where am I most likely to reach them? Like that's gonna be probably the safest way to go forward um, yeah. it, for both the short-term and the long-term. Yeah, that's good life advice too. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Carolyn, would you like to go next? Yeah, sure. Um, I think I'd ask anyone, despite the fact that everything has gotten a bit more complicated and sure is sometimes frustrating a lot, um, especially in the last year, it's always worse to keep the spirit up, to stay motivated, to, yeah, to just look out for the next best way. And I'm sure there will be one <laughs> for everyone. Absolutely. Absolutely. And Thomas, yeah, 
about just, it? Yeah, I'm very aligned with the other. I just second them. I mean, yeah, there's more uncertainty, but uh, okay, change is also what we do in the industry. I, I think it's the it's the interesting part of of the challenge. Certainly. I guess my, my takeaway here, like to to, I, I'm thinking about what Lisa said is. Don't try to copy best practices of others. There's no best practice. I mean, the playbook is yeah. being rewritten. Nobody knows. We're trying to figure out. So copy yeah. others. You will copy the errors. Follow the best practice yeah. and it might not apply for you. So yeah, re, like don't assume anything. Test it for yourself. Uh, trial and error is part of this business. And this is yeah. how we find. Just we have to accept that. And we also have to accept that my my success are not going to be the one for, for the next guy. So you have to find your own ways and probably thinking again about what your customer want is probably the best way to achieve that. So yeah, very yeah. line on 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 this, the opinion on the other on that. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you for those words of wisdom. Uh, thank you so much, Hishan, uh, Lisa, Thomas, Carolyn. It's been a wonderful, wonderful panel. We do have some time for Q and A's from folks in the audience. So please feel free to type out in the chat uh, if you have questions. We have a couple of minutes to go. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm looking through the chat uh, transcript. Uh, What was the best UA channel to use for subscription apps from your experience? Which from Facebook, UAC or ASA would be the best to scale from? Or would you suggest running ad mob ads as well? Have you seen success in Unity ad mob apps? I think we've answered that question, Martin, but uh, tell, me, tell us if that's not addressed. I think we talked about it in the channels section when we talked about the channels. I think TLDR is people are trying a lot more SDK networks, Unity, uh, left off DSPs. Uh, right. Certainly, that there's much more curiosity and appetite. That, that was a question from Martin a couple of minutes ago. Excellent. Looks like we haven't any other questions. Perfect. Uh, Nilay, we will send through the recording. And uh, we'll also aim to put this on the Mobile UA Show podcast with a transcript and notes as we usually do. I'll take a little bit of time. But for now, thank you so much, everybody, for, for being on this wonderful, wonderful uh, webinar. Thank you and have a great rest of your evening, morning, wherever you are in the world today. Yeah, thank take you, guys. Everyone. Thank you. Thank bye. You. Thanks a lot. Bye. 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 bye.